QSO Today, Episode 182, Keith Hibbert, WB2VUO. Welcome to the QSO Today podcast. I'm Eric Guth, 4Z1UG, your host. Keith Hibbert, WB2VUO, is the ARRL Technical Coordinator for Western New York State. In that capacity, Keith serves as a resource and go-to guy for technical questions by HAMS. Keith and I had a great QSO in, on his areas of interest, including QRP, single sideband, digital modes like FT8, and Keith's interest in both amateur HF and aircraft beacons. Keith shares his insights and some valuable resources in this QSO today. WB2VUO, this is Eric for Z1UG. Are you there, Keith? Yes, I am, Eric. Good, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Keith. Thanks for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. Can we start at the beginning of your ham radio story? When and how did it start for you? Well, it started with my next-door neighbor, uh, Bill WA2YQQ. When we moved into the Syracuse area when I was 14, he had this very large antenna and uh, strange noises out of his garage every Saturday, so I walked over to see what was going on. And Bill was talking to his brother on the West Coast. This was from Syracuse, New York, talking to Long Beach, California. And like it looked like a set from a science fiction movie. I was just fascinated that he was able to use you know, this rack of home-built equipment and be talking to his brother like he was sitting in the room with him. Was Bill your first Elmer then? Yes, he was. Uh, he introduced me to the uh, local amateur radio club. This is the Radio Amateurs of Greater Syracuse, or RAGS. And I signed up and took the licensing course in uh, late 1965, uh, which they had at one of the local high schools. The instructor that I, I had primarily was Les, W2OQI, who later became W2CM, W2 Charlie Mike. And uh, he handled the uh, theory and the code for the, the novice. And um, I took the technician at the same time. And it was for the life of me, seeing it's 50 some odd years ago, I can't remember who gave me the tech theory, but it was a member of the club. So at that time, you passed the tech license, or did you go to novice first? Um, the licensing rules at that time allowed both. So I got the novice and the technician, both of them issued in February of 1966. So I had WN2VUO for my novice call and WB2VUO for my technician call, but purposely stayed with the novice bands to get my code proficiency up. And how old were you then? I was 15. There was a, a, a let's see, was I a freshman or I was a sophomore, sophomore in high school. And uh, one of the things that had tweaked my interest many years earlier um, was that my third grade teacher back in 1958. Her husband was a ham, and as a sort of a show and tell, Mrs. Sayer took us in to see uh, uh, Chet's uh, shack. He had the typical late 1950s station with a helicopter's receiver and helicopter's transmitter big tower with a, a Mosley Tribander antenna out behind there. I had absolutely no idea what I was looking at, but it was fascinating. So did you have a little bit of electronics interest along the way? Did you, as a kid, put together some electronic kits? or? No, I developed it. Uh, I got introduced with uh, one of the Merit Badge courses. Uh, the Merit Badge counselor showed us how to take a regular pocket radio, the, the early six transistor uh, AM radios, and readjust them so you could listen to the hams talking on the 160-meter band just above the, uh, the AM broadcast band. So we sat there at scout camp in, like, 1963 listening to the uh, AM activity on 160 meters. And the fact that these people were, you know, working with a radio station and they, they you know, they weren't doing this commercially, it was something that the uh, government let them do as a hobby, it was you know, uh, eye-opening. I never th thought such things existed. Um, this was a strictly strictly a coincidence. In fact, the house the family moved into was about the fourth choice. Uh, I'm the eldest of a large family. I have 11 brothers and sisters younger. Uh, one, of, one of them is a ham also. And uh, Dad picked the house because it had six bedrooms. You know, we needed the rooms and just happened to end up right next, uh, next door to Bill. And we had two more hams that were down the street uh, um, that were active uh, on one of them on six meters exclusively, and the other one had a big quad, was on 20 meters. But uh, there was quite a bit of amateur activity. 
the, the uh, General Electric uh, company was in town, and the, their two-way radio division was one of the uh, manufacturing facilities. So there were probably about 800 amateurs that lived within 20 miles of me that, uh, that, that worked right down the street from our, our house. Do you remember your first rig? My first rig, I, uh, I picked up, uh, while I was working on my license, I picked up a Halicrafters SX-25 receiver. This was a 1939 vintage uh, general coverage receiver. And uh, I built a transmitter that was out of uh, one of the popular electronics magazines at the time, which used a single tube and a uh, crystal and a small power supply, transformer power supply. But um, had a 12 ET7 oscillator and a 6AQ5 audio tube for the output and uh, ran 10 watts input, which meant ran probably 4 to 5 watts output. So it was a, it was a QRP rig. Without knowing the term, I wasn't even aware that QRP was a thing at the time. And what was the band? I was running on 80 and 40 meters at the time. It uh, pretty much everybody that got on the novice band back in those days had a crystal for 3725 kilohertz. Uh, although we call it kill cycles then. We hadn't gone to using hertz as the term. And usually the 40 meter frequency was around 7158 here in the, in the uh, North America. So I had the two crystals that most everybody else had because they were available for 25 cents a piece down at the surplus store. And uh, that's where everybody gathered. Do you remember your first contact? First contact I, the first contact I made was with the amateur radio club at the local Navy Reserve. And um, I was so nervous that I finally, after about three, uh, three go-arounds, I, I sent them my telephone number. <laughs> I I had uh, a case a case of key shyness, if you will. Um, so he called me up and, uh, and congratulated me on the first contact and talked me through what I should be doing to be able to uh, you know get over the uh, over the uh, the nervousness and shakes and such. And I've pretty much been on the air since then, so I think it worked. Did a ham radio play a part in the choices that you made for your education and Yes, career? it did. I ended up, after I got my license, I signed up uh, for the uh, shop courses, electronics, uh, electrical and electronic shop courses. And uh, I had every intention of uh, either becoming a, a two-way radio technician or working as an engineer at a radio station. And what happened? I got into the Navy. They sent me to electronics school, and uh, about the second day in there, one of the chiefs came by and says, hey, uh, uh, you're colorblind. What are you doing here? Can you type? Well, the answer was no. They ended up sending me to pipe fitting school because uh, they wouldn't allow an electronics technician that was colorblind because he might not be able to read the color codes on the resistors. So you went to pipe fitting school, so you're doing plumbing then? Well, the Navy, they call it damage control. Basically, I was a shipboard pipe fitter. I did the uh, plumbing and repair, and I, from there, I went into quality control. And uh, that's what I actually ended up with as a career when I got out of the service. I was an inspector. I see. Now, I read somewhere that you used to do climbing. My my last... Um, which we were my last career choice. I was a welding inspector, and that involved climbing quite a bit to be able to take a look at the structural steel up in the uh, top of the columns and the roofs of the buildings and such. You weren't tower climbing? No, no I never was a tower climber. I, uh, I, I could do it if I needed to, but I usually could find somebody who was uh, much more comfortable with a, with a climbing harness working on that. And I only had two towers in various spots that I lived. Almost everything I had was actually mounted to the house or a tree. Now, you have a tagline on your emails and posts that says, my nightlight runs more power than my rig. Well, what kind of rigs do you use? Yes. Well, at the time, I was running a Tentec Argonaut, the Model 509. This was the second of Tentec's uh, all-mode uh, uh, QRP rigs. It was a 5-watt uh, sideband CW rig. And uh, I had, in addition to that, I also had an Alinko DX70, which in the low power position would run 5 watts. And other than that, was uh, the rest of the equipment was mostly homebrew. I had a, a couple of small transmitters that were built out of articles that were in either QST or the, the Radio Amateur's Handbook and a couple uh, completely uh, roll-your-own designs that I built from the, um, 
you know, the uh, solid state design and the, the amateur radio notebook and various uh, guides and publications. Did you have a particular building style that you liked? I usually tried to etch my own circuit boards with the uh, the circuit board mounted radios. Um, earlier equipment, I used the the old standard chassis and terminal strips. You mount the terminal strips and string all the parts between the terminal strips and the tube sockets. Right, so on, on folded metal chassis. Yep, and uh, one of the, my training in the service, um, sheet metal work was part of the training and the rate that I was in. So from probably 1971 on, I made my own chassis. It got to be too expensive to buy them. Do you have a metal shop in your house now? Oh, no, no. I, I used uh, much uh, much more old-fashioned techniques, uh, wooden blocks and a soft mallet to bend the metal. Really? Well, that, that's a that's a good lesson for some of those some of us that still want to bend metal but don't have a like a bending jig. Yeah, well, a good uh, good selection of various hardwood shapes and a, a soft rubber mallet does a wonderful job in being able to make quarters. Now, it's it's my understanding uh, based on the fact that you're using the um, the Tentec uh, five hundred nine and the Alenco DX seventy turned down to ten watts that you're a QRP operator. Why QRP? When I went into the service, one of the first things that happened was was I had to tailor my station so I could take it with me. So if I had permission to operate, I'd be able to get on the air. The QRP equipment was much smaller, so I could actually fit it in my sea bag and, and transport it with me. The, the, the Argonaut, the small power supply, would uh, fit in about the same space that my shaving kit did. So uh, I could squeeze it in with all of my uh, uniforms and clothing and such and take it with me. Almost any place I was ever stationed, you could always, you know, beg, borrow, or uh, acquire a length of wire to make an antenna. So I never had any problems getting a station up on the air if the command would allow it. I had a couple of state duty stations where, uh, for various reasons, they wouldn't allow a ham radio in operation at all. Did you do any de-expeditions? Effectively, yes. I got stationed in Diego Garcia in the British Indian Ocean's territories. And during 1974, I was one of the two hams that were operating from VQ-9. So uh, we had uh, WB-2POJ slash VQ-9C was operating uh, over in, in his particular barracks, and I was WB-2VO slash VQ-9C. I tended to stay on 15 meters, and uh, Jim stayed over on 20 meters, and we operated from the island. And uh, being the only, uh, the only calls from the island, we were very popular on the air that year. Well, what's your favorite operating mode then when you were operating there, and, and what is it today? I, I operated sideband. I, I always did like uh, getting on phone, and what I found was interesting was the uh, the sideband and the voice operators out there in the Far East were uh, you know, very well organized and far more polite than you'll find in the uh, operations, say, out of the Caribbean or, or even some of the European operations where everybody steps all over everybody else trying to get the contact. Uh, I had a real laugh one time because I realized listening, there was somebody in Japan who was coaching the the uh, beginners in, in the Japanese amateur community as to what they should say to me because they didn't know enough English to be able to talk to me. So somebody would tell them what to say and then they'd repeat it to me and I'd answer back and they'd translate my answer back into Japanese so the, the station I was working could say thank you, you know, for the contact in 73 and they would continue on. And even with the uh, the coach working at the other end, I I could work um, 150 to 200 of them an hour when the band was good. Are you a contester, or or were you then? My contesting was mostly in the VHF range. In addition to the QRP, I really liked VHF operation. I operated the six and two meter bands back in the, the 1960s. In fact, built my uh, own equipment on both of those bands. And I used to regularly operate the ARRLs VHF contests in January, June, and September. Both single sideband. AM originally in the uh, in the late '60s, and then single sideband probably from 1971 on. But I did use a lot of CW in the contests. Uh, the um, 
CW is probably good for an extra 9 to 10 dB in the signal for weak signal work. So I had uh, no qualms with uh, firing up on CW to work somebody if I needed a section or a grid that I wasn't able to get on phone. What What is your current rig? Currently, I've got a Yesu station. Uh, I have a, an FT uh, uh, 857D, which came out of my mobile and is sitting down here. And uh, I'm about um, 90% digital at the present time. I, I got myself into the uh, Joe Taylor WSJTX uh, software for uh, JT65, JT9, and now FT8, which has become very, very popular. And uh, for the field, I've got a, a QRP version, the FT817ND. Uh, unfortunately, over the years, it's harder and harder to get parts for my Tentex that I really like, so they're on the shelf. I'm not using them. Now, with the uh, FT817, <clears throat> where do you take it to the field? I live near the uh, edge of Lake Erie, and I tend to go south and up uh, into the hills. Uh, there are a number of hills that are accessible by car that uh, rise up between uh, 1,500 and 2,000 feet higher than the lake. So I'll go up and find a, a, a suitable, quiet location on the hilltop, not very portable. I have a telescoping 10-meter mast with the uh, fiberglass uh, masts that MFJ and uh, various other groups sell, and uh, uh, string up either a dipole or a string up vertical. And recently I've been trying out the... Um, uh, they call them urchi matchers. So basically, they're a nine to one un un. And uh, the uh, Emergency Amateur Radio uh, Club of Hawaii uh, built them up as a club project, and their name has got stuck on it. So I have a 30 foot vertical wire with the urchi matcher on it and a 30 foot counterpoise. So this is a variation of the uh, pre World War II 30 up and 30 out antenna that was quite popular in the handbook in those days except I've got the uh, antenna mounted on a piece of pipe, which is uh, strapped to the side of my SUV. And it'll be uh, parked off the side of the road, uh, away from power lines and trees and such, and that'll be my antenna. And it's good from 40 through 6 meters. Are you operating soda, or are you just you staying in the vehicle? Um, I'm not operating soda. Unfortunately, I had a mishap back in 2009, and with my artificial knees, hiking to the top of the hill is usually out of the question. I'm just not as mobile as I used to be. Did you do national parks on the air? A little bit, not much. Uh, it, it didn't really catch my interest. I don't know. I, I can't tell you why. Well, one thing is, the closest national park where I am is almost 300 miles from here, so... <laughs> Be a long drive to try to activate one. When you're operating in the field, are you operating under any particular umbrella, either some awards or contest or something like that, or just to get out of the house and operate? No, nope, no, nope, just get out of the house. The uh, the environment here, close to the city of Buffalo, is rather noisy electrically. Uh, we have uh, my backyard is is lined. I have power lines along one side on the back. And the drop to my house runs right over my driveway, so I have a lot of electrical lines here and a lot of electrical noise. If I go up someplace into the uh, hills south of Buffalo and uh, near the ski centers and such, um, I'll find a, a, a zero, you know, S zero noise floor in a just beautifully quiet location. I can, uh, I can hear everybody up there. Don't go for out for any particular, you know, contests or awards like that. I just go up there to operate. Yeah, that sounds really cool. I have actually had those ideas myself that um, it would be great to get out of the neighborhood and just find a nice, quiet spot to operate. Yeah, uh, as long as you don't uh, cross over into somebody's no trespassing area, you're in good shape. But uh, I keep an eye on the signs. And um, usually there's plenty of public areas. Uh, a couple of the townships down to the south of me actually have vistas that look down on Lake Erie. So I have a, a gazebo and a picnic area and so on, and I find that they work very nicely for an operating site. Are, do you operate solar power? Do you carry solar solar panel and uh, batteries? That's in the future. I've had thoughts of doing that. I have a small one-watt panel that I use to keep uh, my, my portable battery, the, uh, the, uh, the lead acid, uh, um, seal that still lead acid battery up. But it's, it's one of those, those projects that I will work on later. I discovered an article that you wrote called the Looper about the Looper antenna. What is a Looper antenna, and how is it used? 
Well, those articles were beginner's articles that I wrote as the uh, technical vice president for the Rockport Amateur Radio Club, and I posted them originally on Packet. And they got picked up by G3YCC, who wrote me and asked permission to put them on his website. <clears throat> Basically, the, the looper was, was a full-wave loop for either 40 or 80 meters that was horizontal. And this would produce a, uh, a high radiation signal for, for NVIS, near vertical incident uh, received, which gives you a very good coverage out to 500 miles or so on those bands. And then the upper bands would start showing some directional characteristics along the, uh, if you will, the apex of the loop. The original idea came from an article that I saw when I was a, a technician called the German Quad. And I believe that was published about 1966 or 67. So I picked up on that idea and continued on with it. Most of the articles that I wrote for the uh, packet bulletin board were, it's a case of, you know, I have these books handy here with all the information. I put them out there uh, to, to help somebody that wanted to get on the air, was looking for some ideas, and also gave them a, a link to be able to get back to me if they wanted more information. It worked in with my um, volunteer work with the American Radio Relay League as a tech specialist and later a technical coordinator. Well, you mentioned that um, that you're an ARRL technical coordinator, and I also saw that on your uh, QRZ page. I don't think I've ever met an ARRL technical coordinator or, or spoke to one. Uh, what is the position, and how do you perform its duties? Well, it's a volunteer position. I was approached by the section manager for the Western New York section as a uh, liaison or a go-to person for anybody that had questions, uh, technical questions having to do with the hobby. And uh, Bill Thomas, uh, W2MTA, who originally had approached me on this, said that I had a reputation for being able to uh, remember articles I had read years before and point somebody in the right direction to look it up. So uh, effectively, he was using me as an organic database. If somebody had a question, he'd send them over to me. I would dig through my memory or look through my books and uh, see if I could come up with uh, some information that would help them out with their question. Nowadays, uh, if somebody gets a hold of the American Radio Relay League and they have a technical question and they're out in western New York, what they'll do is forward the information to me and I contact them quite often via email and uh, see what we can do about getting the, uh, the information that the party needs. Uh, it used to be a lot of questions of antennas, you know, what can I put up and you know, what will fit in my yard and so on. But over the last 20 years, it's evolved into how do I interface my radio with my, my computer that's running Windows, whatever I have for an operating system? A lot of uh, a lot of hands use the computer as a primary accessory in the shack now, and I get a lot of uh, computer and rig questions. What do you think is the most uh, prevalent computer rig question? How do I set my interface up so I can work uh, FT8 or other digital modes? Yeah, that's a great question, as a matter of fact. I, th I think things have changed over time. I think the first time I tried the digital modes, I had to have some interface box. Is are, is that still uh, necessary? Yes, it is. Um, some of the newer rigs have the interfaces built in. They'll, they'll have connections with a USB port right on the radio themselves. But um, primarily the interface takes the... Uh, level the audio from the sound card whatever you're using in the computer or has the sound card itself built in and then ties that into the radio so it does the transition from the uh, radio audio microphone and speaker to the computer and vice versa um at my you know, at this particular point i'm running a commercial interface um i i, I dropped the coin and picked it up it's a, a west mountain uh, rig blaster it has a USB sound card in it, so I'm not using the sound card in the computer. I just have a, a USB connection to the interface, that, which then goes into the back of the, uh, the, uh, the ASO FT-857D. And I have uh, front panel controls to adjust microphone gain and receiver gain and uh, a delay control if I'm going to use Fox. So everything's in the box and all set and ready to go. What do you like about FT-8? FT8 was developed for its very short uh, turnover cycle, uh, primarily for six meters. 
the six meters is characterized by having signals that come and go rather quickly, especially with sporadic heat pro uh, propagation in the summer. And it was a mode that would allow somebody to uh, very quickly complete a digital contact before their signal faded out. Uh, it has since been moved over to HF, and uh, I'd have to say that uh, it's taken over a lot of the activity. There are a lot of people that are running FT8 and nothing else, never, uh, never switched the rig back over. Um, basically, there's a 15-second cycle. Uh, you, you receive for 15 seconds, and then you transmit back for 15 seconds. And um, the <clears throat> interface shows you, uh, well, let's see, I'm looking right now. Mine is set up to show from 300 hertz to 2900 hertz. So I'm looking at a 2600 hertz wide window centered at 14.074 on the 20 meter band. And within that, I've got the volume turned down so you can't hear it, but within that I'm seeing about 15 different uh, uh, contacts going on within that range. Very narrow band, so there's a lot of, you get a lot of activity in a very narrow section of the band. Use the spectrum efficiently. So with 15-second 15, 15 windows, essentially, are you having a, a QSO? Are you actually exchanging uh, more than just call sign? It tends to be more of a, a uh, um, how would you put it, uh, pre-programmed. You have a standard exchange where you exchange the call signs in, in the, a location or grid square, and then the signal reports, you acknowledge the signal reports, and then you can uh, you know, send 73 and continue on. But... They have what they call a free message block. In the free message block, you can take and put other information like, you know, um, my, typically I put in, you know, 5 watts vertical antenna or something like and to that, to that effect to tell them what I'm running for equipment. A um, couple of uh, times I've had people that have come up and have, uh, you know, sent me holiday greetings or something like that through the free message block or, you know, thank me for a new band uh, or a new band or new mode. So it's it's not really a um, a QSO mode or a conversational mode. Let's say you know that's that better. It's not a conversational mode. It's more of a a QSO mode and contest mode. Wouldn't it already know what the um, the signal report would be just based on its um, recovering of the data? I mean, would you actually have to give a signal report? Couldn't the system recover you know what the signal is? Oh, the system generates the signal report. The signal report that they send is um, basically the signal-to-noise ratio of the signal you are talking to, the signal you're working, compared to the overall noise floor of the entire bandwidth that you're looking at. So it'll take a look at the, the uh, say, the, the noise bandwidth for 2.5 kilohertz that you have the window set up for, and then tell you where you are in, in relationship to the total noise within that band. It's usually ex uh, exhibited as a negative figure. Your, your noise, uh, signal to noise ratio will be lower than the entire band. But what's uh, what's happening is, is that the filters that are actually inherent in the software are picking you out from the rest of the noise. So you're, you're effectively being copied beneath the average noise level. Uh, it, it's amazing stuff. I've had some contacts where I can't hear or see the station I'm working. I don't see the display on the computer, and I'm not hearing anything out of the speaker, but I'm getting a solid print. And um, it's, uh, you know, just, it's just, you know, mind-boggling. If I'd had this kind of technology back in 1966, uh, I, I probably would have uh, worked thousands of extra stations that I, I, I never did. But you know, we, we ran different modes back in those days, and it was a much uh, slower and uh, more casual operation. Are there any websites that are, you know, kind of like CW Skimmer that are, um, like, listening to FT8 and reporting, you know, where signals are being heard? Um, the biggest one is a group called, or a site called PSK Reporter. You know, PSK Reporter. And what it does is you can put in the call that you were looking for or your own call, and it will show where you've been heard or where you are hearing. Um, let's see, I'm just trying to think uh, – Okay, there we go. This is yesterday. I'm looking at the last night. I was on 40 meters, and uh, the PSK reporter shows a Google map of the, uh, of in this case, North America. It has a map pin at my location. It shows uh, where I am, and then there are flags. Let's see, I've got one in Virginia. I've got two in Florida. I've got 
uh, two in Texas. I've got one in Oklahoma. I've got a couple in California. I have one in Alaska. I've got one over in Spain. So those are the stations that were hearing me and reporting to PSKReporter.com. Uh, <clears throat> PSKReporter.info, sorry. Uh, is you know it copied my station and it's been put back out on the map on the internet so I can get an immediate feedback as to where I'm being heard and how well I'm being heard just looking at the reporter. So the FT8 software that you're using it's um, it's running on your computer and your computer is connected to the internet. Is there some kind of uh, interaction going on with PSK Reporter automatically? No, it's not. PSK Reporter is something that, <clears throat> excuse me, I run under a separate window. Uh, the uh, uh, software is set up so it will automatically report to PSK Reporter, but it doesn't work the other way. You don't end up having the PSK Reporter's uh, reports of other stations hearing you coming back to your software. So there's, uh, you don't have a, a direct feedback into the software to, to give you a heads up and say, hey, look for so-and-so. I guess what I'm asking is, and, and maybe I think you're answering it, and that is is that your software is re, is listening to that entire spectrum, you know, where um yes. right where FT8 is. And so even if you're not having yes. a, a, a QSO with the other stations in that bandwidth, that information is still being recovered and being reported to PSK Reporter. Yes, it is. And uh, let's see. Well, that's pretty cool. Looking here, it, it's, uh, let's see, at the time of this report, there were 498 reports sent from my station of, of uh, you know, reception of 12 different countries. Well, that was over the last two hours. So my receiver is sending a report back to the website, the PSK Reporter website, that I heard 498 different stations in 12 different countries, and they're dis you know, displayed on the map. Wow. So even if you're not um, transmitting... Um, as you're sitting there listening, then all this this information that that you could have keep, uh, people that you could have QSOs with that information is being reported to PSK Reporter. Yes, it is. That's pre that's pretty interesting. Well, it almost gives you a second receiver. You get a chance to to, to see what's being uh, heard around the world. You know, either of you or of other stations. The uh, Recently, there's been a couple of our Antarctica expeditions that have been operating, um, oh, I'm, I don't know the, how you would put it anyway, they've been on the coast, so basically on the north edge of the continent, um, south of um, uh, South Africa, south of Argentina, and uh, it's not unusual for them to just leave the rig in automatic when they're working on some of their scientific projects, and people can see that they're being heard in Antarctica. We have the uh, Bove Island uh, de expedition coming up. Um, as I, I see on their yeah. um, Facebook page that they're in transit, it's my understanding they'll also be operating FT8. Yes, and it's uh, pretty much the uh, main topic of conversation on a number of the Facebook uh, interest pages with the FT8 mode. Um, I will work them if I hear them, but I'm, I'm pretty much not a DXer anymore, so I, I'm not going to go out of my way. If I happen to run across them, fine, but uh, I'm not going to sit there and, you know, camp on the radio for 20 hours straight trying to find them. As the ARRL technical coordinator, uh, what kind of advice do you give to hams that live on a on a city lot or in a in a development where they have uh, HOA and covenants, where they can't really have visible antennas. Well, what do you suggest for them? Uh, recently, I've been suggesting magnetic loop. Give that a try. And um, although there's some very good models out there commercially, uh, it actually, a magnetic loop antenna can be built for a lot less than you can buy one of the commercial models. Uh, the other option is very thin wire and put up a, a, you know, a stealth antenna, something that's uh, basically invisible. Um, most anything will work as an antenna. And so, you know, the, the important thing is to get something out there. Um, one of the hams here in the Buffalo area that's stuck with a, an HOA re uh, requirement has a mobile antenna mounted on the uh, um, newspaper rack on the back of his bicycle. So he parks the bicycle on his patio out behind the condo, 
and runs cable in under the door, and he gets on the air with the uh, the hamstick mobile antenna on his bicycle. He's operating digital modes then? No, he's operating sideband. He's on 40 meters. Really? He's, he he uh, checks, in, checks into the uh, one of the regional nets uh, quite often and uh, operates sideband with, uh, with his friends down around 72, 75. So he's got a mobile antenna on a bicycle, and he's sitting there with a 100-watt radio and uh, being able to work up and down the coast, uh, you know, about 800 to 1,000 miles. Oh, that's pretty cool. I guess um, there's all kinds of things we could load up, you know, like the patio umbrella or something like that. Yes. I had a tra- friend who was a traffic handler and got on traffic nets back in the 70s. He actually put a uh, three-turn loop around the ceiling of his apartment and operated 80 meters that way. Well, we're talking magnetic loops then. If you're if you're operating, you know, 10 watts or below, then you don't need to have the uh, vacuum variable capacitors that may cost you a couple hundred dollars. That's correct. There's uh, a couple companies that sell capacitor kits so you can build butterfly capacitors and um Excuse me. There's uh, a number of different designs that can be uh, built with, uh, with hand tools at home for, for making a variable capacitor. Uh, one of the ones that I saw here about seven years ago, somebody had was a trombone. They had the one half inch tubing that telescoped into one inch tubing, and then they had it wrapped with Teflon tape. So the capacity between the two sections of tubing was what they were using for tuning the loop. And hey, there's a guy on the. Um on uh, YouTube that is using a couple of um, pep- Pepsi cans as a capacitor. And, yeah. Right? So he's, he's got a can going into another can, and that works just fine. Yep, the same idea. Uh, probably using the same type of plastic uh, uh, pipe tape, too. Right, and using, uh, as I recall, he was using uh, water in a syringe. He had, so he had a syringe at each end, and he'd actually either suck the water out, causing the... Um, the syringe to com- compress or push the water in and ha- having it expand in order to open and close that, that that capacitor. I'll put a link to that in the show notes page. Well, uh, I remember seeing that, but uh, that's not something that I kept the link to. It's interesting, but I hadn't happened to have kept that one. I, I tend to go with more of the mechanical couplings. Uh, based, based upon my research, you seem to have an interest in... in Beacons in general and aircraft beacons. I saw in a couple of um, airport sites in Canada where you reported hearing um, airport beacons. Can you ex- explain what beacons are and why you listen to them and how they interest you? Sure can. Um, basically, I started out with a propagation beacon. I wanted to have something that put a signal out there so that when everybody thought the band was closed, they could actually hear that there was propagation. And in 1976, I put a low-power beacon on the 10-meter band. Uh, This was the bottom of the sunspot cycle. We were waiting for everything to come back up. So I had a one-half-watt transmitter that operated at at, at 28,250. When I was in the shack, I turned it on, and it would send out my my call and uh, the the location that I was at, which was uh, Connecticut, New London, Connecticut. You know, somebody was tuning across the band and thought it was closed. And all of a sudden, they'd find a CW signal in there because the uh, band actually had some propagation to it. In the late 70s, the FCC allowed automatic operation of beacons like that. So I built one up with a with a uh, ID board, um, which, oh, it was taken out of a repeater. I believe you used a diode matrix and um, put it in one of the, uh, the sites out in the county, one of the hams who didn't operate the band. We, put it out in his backyard with the vertical. I ran the 10-meter beacon from 1979 through 2005. The only reason I didn't put it on the air when I moved in 2005 was there were already two beacons in the area, and having a third one would be redundant. So I put it on the shelf and uh, just um, kept reporting what I heard but wasn't operating one. Now, the other beacons you were mentioning are what do they call non-directional beacons, or NDBs. These are beacons that were used for uh, approach and control for airports or used for navigation on inland waterways, such as canals and the Great Lakes. And these typically are 25 to 100 watt transmitters on the low frequency range down between 180 and 450 kilohertz. And uh, they're 
probably still 700 to 1,000 of them across uh, North America and a comparable number in through uh, you know, Europe and Africa, too. Either a low-cost uh, uh, method of navigation, and what was fascinating to me was if a lot of these beacons would have, uh, say, a 25-watt beacon that would be at an airport in, a, well, we'll say, a small lake in central Ontario. They were designed to provide the last 20 miles. The pilot would hear that as he was coming in, tune it in, and that would give him a signal to guide him in on the last 20 miles to get into visual range of the airport and be able to spot the airport and the, and the runway and land. And I'm sitting out 800 to 1,000 miles away copying uh, that, that low-power beacon here in my shack. The uh, equipment I'm using is simple. I have the uh, general coverage receive on my, my existing high-frequency transceiver of two down below the broadcast band, and I could uh, I could copy them without much problem uh, during the day out to about 300 miles and at night out to about uh, 1,500 to 2,000 miles. Now, are these beacons on? They're all in different frequencies, so you you just kind of select the frequency that you want. And yes, they are. Well, um, the, the MDBs are on assigned frequencies. So, for instance, we'll say um, we'll, we'll say, for instance, the uh, Syracuse International Airport, Clarence E. Hancock International Airport. They have a, a non-directable beacon, which is associated with the airport, and uh, um, without looking at the chart, I'm going to say it's on 373 kilohertz. So uh, air, um, anybody that was uh, flying that wanted to be able to find that particular airport, they would uh, look it up. They'd find the NDB listed for that airport, tune their receiver to it, their, their beacon receiver to it, and uh, navigate in on the beacon. Um the uh, one that I'm thinking of that I know right off the bat, 322 kilohertz is the Buffalo Beacon, BUF. And uh, <clears throat> that's uh, used for uh, uh, traffic on the Great Lakes uh, plus uh, directional uh, traffic into the Buffalo Airport. So either a plane flying in, uh, if they were using the NDBs, or a ship that's looking for the harbor could tune it in, and then with the direction finding from the loop that's on the uh, Low frequency receiver. They could uh, you know, make sure they were going in the correct direction and headed in the right uh, towards the right port. Now, with GPS, aren't uh, beacons obsolete? Pretty much so. Yes, and they are being decommissioned, unfortunately, and shut down. Uh, a lot of the ones that were uh, intriguing to hear, like you know, small uh, small airports uh, out in uh, in uh, rural areas of, of the United States, Canada. Um, it's a cost uh, matter as much as anything. It, it, you got to pay for the electricity to run the beacon. So if everybody's going to navigate in with the GPS. No reason to be wasting power on a transmitter there that's sitting out at the end of the runway. So they're shutting them down. Um, a couple of the uh, internet sites that I have looked at are uh, talking about as many as 15 a month are being shut down across the United States and Canada. Is the same thing happening with um, amateur radio beacons? Are amateur radio beacons as popular now as they once were? They're even more popular. Um, there's a um, couple of different companies that make small transmitters uh, that can be uh, adapted to beacon use. And uh, QRP Labs, for instance, has one uh, called the uh, the Ultimate uh, Ultimate. Uh, 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 <coughs> excuse me, I'm drawing a blank. The Ultimate QRP. Uh, U3S is the, is the model on it. Um, these beacons can be uh, set up and operated either uh, you know, a standalone mode for things like a pre-flight balloon, or they can be operated as a beacon from the house. They can be set up for CW operation. They can be set up for the various digital modes like Whisper and Olivia. And uh, the board is uh, very cost effective. Uh, you know, the transmitter board uh, and, and beacon control can be set up for under $50 US. And that would include a GPS receiver to uh, uh, keep the frequency uh, set and keep the time set and, and uh, such. And basically, hook to 12 volt source, hook it to an antenna, and you're on the air and ready to run. So the number of beacons has increased drastically. Primarily due to maybe whisper uh, net operation? A, a lot of it are whisper, but surprisingly, there's still a lot of it on CW. Uh, there's, uh, in 10 meters, uh, Bill Hayes, uh, WJ5O, uh, runs the, uh, the, the beacon coordination list 
and <clears throat> he's a coordinator for Region 2, North and South America. And the last time that I looked over at his 10-meter beacon list, he had about 450 listings between uh, 28.06 and 20, uh, 28.33 uh, with beacons all over the world and probably about 150 of them in the United States. He's at uh, www.qsl.net slash wj5o slash beacon.htm. And he updates his list every couple of days. Are there beacons on the lower bands, 160, 80, 40 as well? Yes, there are. I, I don't follow them very much. There's just one on, on 30 meters that I, I follow because I, it, it's interesting that somebody would move from 10 meters to 30 meters. And um, this W0ERE, Whiskey Zero Echo Radio Echo, he has a beacon up in the Ozark Mountains in Arkansas on the on the 30 meter band. Um, I tended to concentrate on 10 meters. Um, there are VHF beacons on six meters and on two meters, uh, four meters in Europe. Um, the 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 1.3 meter band, the 70 centimeter band, and up into the microwave range. A lot of those tend to be club activities, trying to uh, provide a, a signal so that people can check out their equipment, make sure that everything's all aligned properly and ready to go. But um, they also are there for uh, propagation. Um, they've got a two-meter beacon that I hear from the hilltops, which is out near Rochester, New York. And the Rochester VHF group runs it. And uh, if I uh, tune over and hear the uh, W2UTH beacon, I know that the conditions are good enough that I'm going to be able to, to work the 100-plus mile path from my hill to there. What excites you the most about what's happening in amateur radio now? The ease to be able to do, uh, get on the different modes, uh, the uh, computer-generated digital modes, either through the uh, Joe Taylor software package, WSJT, or the uh, um, FL Digi, W1HJK out in New Massachusetts wrote a package called FL Digi that is almost a Swiss army knife of different modes. It covers uh, everything from basic CW up to some of the very uh, exotic forward error correcting modes um, that, are, that are used for uh, you know, long haul um, Long haul communications where there, you need to be able to verify and, and get 100% copy on everything. The, uh, the nice thing about it is they're all you know, freely offered to the amateurs. You, you don't have to go and spend a whole lot of money on it. You can uh, you know, download the uh, software right off of the internet, load it into your home computer, either a Mac or a PC, and interface it with the radio, and you're ready to go on the air. What advice would you give to newer returning hams to the hobby? Don't limit yourself. Don't don't sit there and say, you know, I'm just going to buy a, a, a Chinese FM handheld and get on two meters. You know, you know, shoot, for, shoot for the sky. Try to get as much uh, you know, capability as you possibly can. Uh, uh, you know, Fine to start out with the VHF radio, but make sure that you keep something going on HF, if nothing more than a receiver, so you can see what's going on there. And uh, try to find a local club. Now, the local clubs were the uh, the backbone of amateur radio in the 60s when I got my license. My uh, original Elmers that helped me get on the air, the people in the training courses all came through the, uh, the local club there in Syracuse, the radio amateurs of greater Syracuse. When I was living in Rochester, we had the Rochester Amateur Radio Association. We had a club in Brockport, New York, and a club in Batavia, New York. And the, the monthly meetings, if nothing else, it gives you a chance to actually meet the people you're talking to. So you have an idea of who else is active in the hobby. And also find out what they actually do in, uh, shall we say, the, the real life. You know, when they're not in, involved in the hobby, what do they do out there in their, their regular job? Um, I've run into people in amateur radio who did anything from, uh, you know, built, building commercial radio stations to, uh, you know, paving driveways, uh, lawyers, people who run grocery stores, uh, farmers, the dairy farmers. And one fellow I used to talk to, and at 4 o'clock in the morning, he'd uh, say he's uh, headed out to see his girls. And in this case, it was all of the herd that he had to milk. So, you know, we got all walks of life in the hobby. 
My wife's got her license. She was a school teacher. She taught uh, pre pre K and kindergarten. So um, she used to say, if a kindergarten teacher could figure out how to get a license, anybody could. So you know, don't uh, don't limit yourself. Go for the you know, go for all the gusto. Keith, I want to thank you so much for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. And with that, I'll wish you 73. Okay. Glad to help and help out anybody that's looking in the hobby. And always glad to talk about ham radio. That concludes this episode of QSO Today. I hope that you enjoyed this QSO with Keith. Please be sure to check out the show notes that include links and information about the topics that we discussed. Go to www.qsotoday.com and put in WB2VUO in the search box at the top of the page. If you'd like to sponsor the transcription of this episode or any of the previous QSO Today episodes into written text, the cost is $67. U.S. There is a button on the right side of the show notes page to start this process. Support the QSO Today podcast by first joining the QSO Today email list. I will not spam you or share your email address with anyone. Become a listener sponsor monthly or annually by clicking on the sponsor buttons on the show notes pages. And finally, let Amazon pay us at no charge to you by using our Amazon link on our website before you enter Amazon to do your shopping. Amazon gives us a small percentage of everything that you buy. Your privacy is assured as we do not see who is purchasing and what is being purchased. By supporting the QSO Today podcast, you offset my out-of-pocket expenses to record, produce, and host over 182 episodes of QSO Today. I am extremely grateful for your support. Until next time, this is Eric, 4Z1UG, 73. The QSO Today podcast is a product of KEG Media Inc., who is solely responsible for its content.